we're continuing on to our final leg of our series for Holy Week on Easter Sunday. In my home, after I preach here, I will be rushing to my home, and we typically have an, an annual Easter outreach celebration of sorts that my wife has been doing since my kids were very small. We ventured from everything to washing children's feet. I remember the early days, and we would, I would kneel. The first time we did this, I knelt down, and my kids were very small, and I had to wash their little feet. And they were, it was funny because they didn't know how to react, and they were, they were kind of getting tickled about it. And it was just uh, one of those things that my wife always does. You may be wondering that when you celebrate Easter, there will be Easter eggs and there will be Easter bunnies. And you're probably wondering where this tradition came from. The idea of Easter eggs and Easter bunnies really has nothing to do with Jesus. It is actually a celebration of springtime because chances are when you celebrate Holy Week in Europe and in the West, it usually is right around spring. And during springtime, you've got the most uh, fragile of animals, the chick and the egg and the rabbits that come to surface once the bitterness of winter ends. As such, through generations and generations, people celebrated Easter with bunnies and collared eggs, and obviously the tradition just got uh, bigger and bigger and bigger until they started rolling the eggs and hiding them in grass and Easter egg hunts and all these other things happened. The point in saying all of this is because I'm almost certain that when I get home today, we're going to have the traditional Easter eggs in plastic uh, Easter eggs, and my wife will have little questions inside of them and make sure that all of us are engaged and all our guests who will be coming, we're inviting people. Chances are these are the people that who really wouldn't have any other reason to come to our house other than Easter Sunday. It's usually an outreach for us as a family. And today we're going to do that. Now, in preaching this, I'm using a text out of the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1. 1 Peter is not the typical Easter Sunday message, but I believe that this one captures a good essence of the idea of the resurrection life. It begins with the words, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, Peter, as you know, was disappointed, was frustrated, was discouraged by the fact that his master had died, And all of a sudden, he became lost for direction, and there was a hopelessness about his life because of the loss of Jesus. Only after the resurrection, and Peter was becoming a, in many cases, a very, a a person who was very afraid of the authorities, at one point being uh, confronted by a servant girl, he denies Christ. And all of a sudden, in 1 Peter chapter 1, he makes a declaration, a very succinct And yet a very powerful declaration that says, I am Peter and I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, boldly giving testimony, boldly proclaiming the life of Jesus, whereas previous to this, he was lost for where he was going. Now, it goes on further, it says, to those who are the elect exiles of the dispersion of Pontius, of Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And I want to lay a important foundation as we talk about this. In a few minutes, we're going to be very practical in how we apply these. But I want to lay a foundation of your understanding of the words of 1 Peter chapter 1. This is a letter of the apostle to the Jews, and he's reaching out to the Jews from the exiles of the dispersion. The dispersion refers to the destruction of Jerusalem when the Babylonians conquered it and spread the different Jews all over the world. The Jews, because of their sin against God, the covenant with God ended in the Old Testament, and they were dispersed all across the world. They ended up in places like Pontus, in Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, and all the way to places like Russia, as we know today. The Jews were dispersed, and these were the people that Peter was addressing this letter to. Now, I want to give you a bit of a history and a background of how that happened because of the word Pentecost. Pentecost is the Greek word for a celebration that the Jews would have annually. It was a celebration of the giving of the law of Moses. And to be reminded of their life as Jews, they celebrated this feast every week, every year. And on this particular year, the Jews from all over the world were in Israel in Jerusalem, and they were gathering together, and as you know, the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples, and they began to speak in other tongues. They began to speak in different languages, 
and there was confusion in the city, mainly because the people were there and they were wondering what these people, why these people were able to speak in their own language, knowing that they were actually locals who were from Galilee. Now, reading in Acts chapter 2, verse 5, now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation. That's the picture I was giving you a while ago, so that when we unpack the practical application of this, you understand the, the theology and the, and, the, and the meaning of what the Scripture is saying here. Devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Now think about this. All these people from different places all over the world were gathered together in Israel, and they started hearing these disciples speaking in their own language, proclaiming Jesus Christ. And they were all bewildered by this. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How can they instantly speak our language? Because it was supernatural. The power of the Holy Spirit descended upon them. Now, here's the point I want to make and how it is that we hear each of us in our own native language. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and the visitors from Rome. The amazing, amazing truth of this one verse is showing us the history of the church. That the church did not emanate just from the Jews. The church did not emanate just from a, a nationality. It actually Im, it came out of many nations. That's the roots of Christianity. And these were Jews, remembering that Peter was the apostle to the Jews while Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. And so he was writing in First Peter to these people. Both Jews and proselytes, that word proselytes, are people from other nations who may not necessarily be Israelites, but were converted to Judaism as the Jews reached out to them about Yahweh. I'm laying the foundation so you understand. Now, as the gospel prospered on, people got saved, people got born again, and Peter was now writing to these Jews all over the world and reminding them about what they had put their faith in. Acts 2, 14, but Peter standing... Be standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice in boldness, proclaiming in the midst of Romans and soldiers and everyone else, declaring that he is now an apostle of Jesus Christ. No longer afraid and in boldness speaking publicly. Back to 1 Peter chapter 1. is the summary of that first verse. And down in verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to, to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Now here he's saying, basically saying, according to the great mercy of God, the reason why we have salvation, the reason why we enjoy the faith that we enjoy, is not because of anything we've done, but strictly because of the mercy of God. There's a lot to be said about mercy. It's almost like mercy is when you do something wrong and yet somebody decides to not impose judgment upon you. It'd be like causing something very bad that you did to your wife and instead of being made to sleep in the doghouse, you're made to sleep in the bedroom again. That's mercy. And in a sense, that's what happened to us. The difference with mercy that's human mercy is that God's mercy does not remove this application of justice. The application of mercy, for instance, for a political person who's committed a sin or an injustice, and the president may pardon him, and yet at the same time skip the role of justice. The gospel is not like that. We've been given mercy, and yet in the midst of that, the justice of our sins was paid for us by Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. I love that phrase, born again to a living hope, particularly being declared by the apostle Peter. You got to remember that Peter is a different character. When I was uh, a very new Christian and we were in a discipleship group, Pastor Steve would teach us and say, if you really want to learn about the Bible, one of the things you can do is study Bible characters. 
And early on, one of the people that I studied was Peter. And Peter is the guy who, in the midst of a storm, went out and walked on water. How many of you know there is not a single disciple of Christ apart from Peter who actually walked on water? There's something about this guy that's full of hope and vigor. In the midst of that walking on water, he's the same guy that almost drowned in the same storm. He's really a funny character when you read his life. And he's a rambunctious, strong man. He's a fisherman. He's bold. He's the same guy that Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And he's also the same guy where Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. So this guy is like a, an extreme of sorts. He's a guy who knows what he's talking about. When he speaks of hope, he understands what it means to be so full of hope and see what Jesus could actually accomplish and yet watch that being dashed right before his eyes and lose all hope and all possibility. And the reason why he was transformed, in essence, is found in this verse because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Something changed from just belief, from just knowing things, from having a good theology to knowing that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. We can learn from the life of Peter that as we grow and mature in our faith, we need to further clarify and understand what this thing means. As a way of review, I want to read to you a few verses out of the book of 1 Corinthians as to what this means for you and me. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 42 says, So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. In other words, our bodies that are perishable will one day resurrect from the dead imperishable. No more sickness, no more disease, no more warts, no more eye bags, no more high hairlines, no more, nothing, imperishable, completely imperishable. It says not only that, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. There's something that's going to be glorious about this body. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It's an amazing promise when part and parcel of our faith is this idea of not just Jesus resurrecting from the dead, but by virtue of him resurrecting from the dead, we too will one day resurrect from the dead. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness and it's raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Something happens to a person who understands this simple truth about our faith, one of which is boldness. Boldness naturally comes when you know this. Peter was already afraid, disappointed, hopeless, running, fugitive in many ways, and yet when he understood the resurrection to the dead, boldness came upon him. Again, in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter, something that they saw, these were men that were being persecuted by Roman soldiers, by the elite of society, by the wealthiest of society, and yet there was a boldness, the boldness of Peter, and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus and that Jesus had resurrected. One of the telltale signs of a person who understands very clearly the merit and the value of the resurrection from the dead is boldness. But the second aspect of the things that happens when you understand the truth of the resurrection is a clear conscience. We operate with a clear conscience we, when we understand the resurrection to the dead. In, the, in, in a verse in the book of Acts, chapter 25, 24 rather, verse 15 and 16, Paul says, having a hope in God with which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. It's powerful, isn't it? He says that there is going to be one day the resurrection from the dead of the righteous and the unrighteous. This is not mere annihilation. We're not all just going to become extinct. We will all one day resurrect from the dead. And he says, by virtue of that, I always take the pains to have a clear conscience toward God and man. 
when you know that one day you're going to resurrect from the dead and that there will be a time of accountability, you're going to live with a clear conscience between God and man. Something happens when Christians understand the fullness of what it means that one day you will resurrect from the dead. It's not only that you're going to have a boldness about you, a clear conscience in the way you live, in the way you act, in the way you think, in the way you say things, changes what our conscience is clear. First Peter chapter 1, verse 4, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. He says, talks about this idea of the resurrection. It's not just a technicality. It's not just a reversing of your atoms and a redesigning of your cell system or a chemical uh, manifestation of sorts that whew, your body is all of a sudden this imperishable thing. Sometimes when you think of the, of the resurrection of the dead, our concept is we just want to know how will that happen. Rather, he says, it is like an inheritance. Inheritance is something that is given to you, something that you actually don't deserve, something that somebody produced, preserved, protected, something that actually provided for you for free, something that's locked up in some vault. How many of you know if you knew that you had an inheritance in a vault somewhere, you want to know that your name is on that inheritance? You want to know the people who have the safety numbers to that vault. You want to make sure that that thing is protected. And he's saying the resurrection of the dead is like this inheritance. Something you want to know, make sure you understand and know. Something that one day is going to be given to you, not because of anything you've done, but it was provided for you for free. Produced for you by no less than Jesus himself. Protected and preserved so that you will one day enjoy that moment. But he says it's a, an inheritance that's imperishable. Unlike the properties and finances that we get, at some point they will perish, folks. Regardless of what they are, when you think about the devaluations of 1998 and 2008 and all the other uh, switches and turns and curves of the economies and property markets, they someday perish. The resurrection of the dead is an imperishable inheritance. He said it's not just an imperishable inheritance, it's an inheritance that cannot be defiled. You sometimes think about these inheritances that people receive and it's the source of bitterness and anger and court suits and misunderstandings and fights. In some cases, even the cause of wanting to kill each other. It's defiled. Yet he says this inheritance is not just imperishable, it's undefilable if there's such a word. And finally, he says it's unfading. It'll never lose its value. Over the holidays, my wife and I wanted to check out a resort down east, and we said it must, we want to take a look at it because we had some memories about the place, and we drove out there. And memories of that place was it was lush and green and trees and, and just a phenomenal clubhouse. And we got there, and the thing was in disarray. The trees were no longer as beautiful, could no longer be maintained. Clubhouse had doorknobs that were falling apart, fading inheritances. The one inheritance that the Bible says will never fade is the guarantee that one day we're going to resurrect from the dead. And it's being kept in heaven for you, preserved, guaranteed that one day you can have it. Before I left for Taipei, I got news of one of our members who used to be a member of our church here and his wife contracted cancer and for three years they had to sell their home and use that money really basically to pay for her medical needs. And just before I left, I heard that she finally passed and she's a, she's a young mother. Her name is Isai Tanabe and her husband Dudes, and some of you may know them, are professional photographers. And she died. And that day, just before I left, and I was busy because of things I had to do that day, but I had to make sure that I went to this one because they're old friends and they had moved to our church in Malolos, Bulacan. They relocated there because it's, it's actually more reasonable to leave, live there. And 
I went to the wake, and if I may give you a short tip, some of you who are younger, or even those of you who are older, when you go to stuff like this, wakes and funerals, there's times when you shouldn't say anything. And you should just sit there. And I sat there for about four and a half hours and just being a friend and listening to my friend talk about, brag about his wife and talk about with tears with his three lovely daughters, very young daughters, knowing full well this concept of the resurrection of the dead. But in the midst of the tears was the joy that she is with the father and that one day they will all, all join them there. In the coffin, there were these letters for each of the daughters and the husband, and there were apparently a lot of letters. Something happens to us, a peace, a joy, a guarantee of sorts that life has better things in store in the midst of tragedy. I went home that night and throughout the flight to Taipei, I, I kept on praying for dudes and his daughters and thinking about how awesome what we have as a faith. That apart from that, it would have been miserable and, 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 and really a dead end for everybody. But that is what we're talking about. First Peter chapter 1, verse 5, who by God's power are being guarded. That's the interesting thing about this, this, this inheritance. Is not only is it guaranteed that it'll be there, safe for our use, we're actually being guarded to make sure we are not disqualified from the inheritance. I don't know if you know that certain inheritances, when you open it, has, has certain terms and conditions. The, 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 the father probably saying, if you don't do this, then you don't get the inheritance. And yet here in this particular inheritance, the Bible says that we are being guarded by the power of God through faith to make sure that we will one day have this inheritance. In this you rejoice. There's a rejoicing that comes in the midst of whatever trial. And Peter was writing to a people who were being persecuted left, right, and center. They were being persecuted by the Jews because they were in the synagogues and they were being thrown out. They were being persecuted by the Romans. They were being persecuted by their own families because they were being disowned. They were being disowned by the very people in commerce and industry because they would say, you cannot worship these idols. And that was a business for some people. Persecution was everywhere. And yet Peter says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved with various trials. In essence, what he's saying is in the midst of whatever you're going through, some of us will go through more severe trials than others. Some of us will probably not. But whatever it is we're going through, he says, you can rejoice because you're guaranteed of this inheritance. One of my favorite quotes from C.S. Lewis is this. The words of Scripture were first preached and, and long practiced in a world without chloroform. Now, for those of you who are younger, you might not know what chloroform is. Well, chloroform is the old anti an anesthesia of the day that they made you smell so that you would have an anesthetic feel in your body so you can overcome pain. And he was saying that the, the things of Scripture were long lived and practiced in a world without pain relievers. Today, when we have a little headache, we take a pain and it's gone. And he's saying there were things that these people lived by. And yet in the midst of that, they understood the one thing that caused them to overcome, that one day in the midst of my trials, I will resurrect from the dead. As I close this afternoon, I want to read a blog post that my wife wrote a few days ago. I asked her, my wife guest blogs on my website once a month, and I asked her to write this blog for Easter because she's so good at it. Through the years, she's had Easter celebrations in our home to reach out to people. I'm, I, I don't even know who our guests are. I'd be surprised if we had the security guard of the village in our home tonight. In other words, she just reaches out to people, particularly during Easter when things are a little lighter and people are not busy. But I want to read her blog to you as I close and understand this idea of trials. The title of the blog is On Birthdays and Easter. It's a little bit of a read, so you just come and follow me. It says, last night I cried my eyes out. 
A young mom passed away after her three-year-long bout with cancer. I doubly cried when I found out that she left this earth on the day of her eldest daughter's 18th birthday. She had three young girls. This is Isai's uh, daughters. Actually, she died on the day that her daughter was celebrating her 18th birthday. Sad things happen to good people, and we are left with question marks in our thought bubbles. Why? At the memorial service, all three of her sweet young daughters spoke. Laughter, mingling with tears, aching pauses at the memories and beautiful photos of their mom and family times together. Then her husband spoke. The man who loved her, who aside from his work became her constant partner, confidant, cheerleader, chef, driver, injection giver, and stress reliever. He shared how on this first night alone, he opened his wife's iPad and found instructions and a password. His sweet wife had left letters, lots of letters for him and for each of the three girls to read at different stages. She had also left her favorite quotes and songs to be sung, all worship songs for her wake and funeral. He talked about the vows they had shared as husband and wife on their wedding day. Knowing that it is God's will for me to marry you, I make a commitment to you today to love you with an everlasting love, to live with you in an understanding way. He talked about the joy of having her as his wife. Then he did something very brave and inspiring. In the midst of his tears, he addressed each daughter one by one and spoke of words of blessing to each one. He also told the eldest never to think of her birth date with sadness as a date marred by the death of her mother, instead to regard that day as a very special day, a day of two combined celebrations, two birthdays, her birthday on earth and her mom's birthday in heaven, two reasons to celebrate. And then he proceeded to give each daughter a ring. I was wondering why. Then he spoke. Just as his wife and he had committed through the same rings, rings to love each other unconditionally, many, many years ago on their wedding day, he began to speak words of affirmation now to his daughters. I make a commitment to you, our daughters, to love you with an eternal love, to live with you in an understanding way, never leaving you or forsaking you. He then gave his daughters their rings as a sign of his unconditional fatherly love for them. Two were the wedding rings he and his wife had worn. One was the ring his wife also wore, which came from his parents. By this time, all the Kleenex in, the, in my bag, by this time, all the Kleenex in my bag, all the Kleenex in the room, perhaps all the Kleenex in the universe was gone after he finished speaking. Needless to say, I was reflective in a reflective mood when I arrived at home. I was supposed to write a blog on Easter for Joey's website, but all I could think of was that scene, how the father in their midst of his own pain, grief and mourning, mourning at his loss, at his own loss, chose to bless the children that he loved. And I thought of our Heavenly Father and of Jesus, who at the expense of his own trials, extreme pain and cruel death, chose to pay the price we couldn't pay to win a prize we couldn't win. And how Easter to me is somehow another birthday of Jesus. Christmas, we celebrate his birth on earth as a man. Easter, we celebrate his freedom from his earthly body and his life reunited with his Father in heaven. Most of all, we celebrate his win. He punched death in the face and rendered it powerless. He rendered sin toothless in its efforts to bite us and to hold us captive in its grip. And all I could say was thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for your heaven birthday, and thank you for my friends. We think so much of this life on earth when we really should think of where we are spending our other birthday. Do you know where you're spending your eternity birthday? Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Would you stand on your feet as we close in a word of prayer? Just close your eyes, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. God, thank you for your holy word. Thank you for the celebration of Easter. Father, thank you that you've made Easter so plain for us to see. If you're here today and you have never heard this message of the gospel, Jesus Christ died for your sins. He came to save you, to give you an imperishable, unfading inheritance.
that you can have that will never be defiled, never be corrupted, never be tainted. And if you're here today and you're saying, God, I've, I've never heard of this before, and I choose to receive this free gift from you today, this Easter Sunday, would you just lift up your hand very quickly just for me to see? God, you're looking at our hands, Lord. Lord, there's so many hands here. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that as our, we raise our hands, Lord, that we would understand the simple truth about your love for us. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to touch us to the core of our hearts. Would you just pray this with me, Father? Just say, Father, wherever you're standing, Father, I thank you. I thank you. I've never heard this message before. I've never understood it. But today, it's clear to me. I thank you for forgiving me of all my sins. I thank you for rescuing me. I thank you for giving me the inheritance that is imperishable, that is incorruptible, that is unfading. And God, today I receive it wholeheartedly, putting my faith in nothing and no one but you, Jesus. Be the Lord of my life. Take preeminence and prominence over the affairs of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And for the rest of us, would you just lift up your hands towards heaven? God, thank you. We're grateful for the resurrection life. The answer, the ultimate answer to the ultimate question. That we will never die because of what you've done for us. God, we bless you. We love you. We praise you. Jesus, we glorify you. Would you bring boldness and a clear conscience, free of guilt, willing to stand for what is right as we stand before you and before men. And Father, even as we lift up our hands today, make plain the truth about the resurrection life. Make plain the truth about our eternal inheritance in Christ Jesus our Lord. And everyone said, Amen and Amen.